welcome to the podcast for Cultural Reformation, a ministry of the Ezra Institute, where we equip current and emerging cultural leaders with biblical worldview, Christian philosophy, and cultural apologetics studies through residential training programs and print and digital resources. Greetings to you. I'm Michael Thiessen, and together I am here with Pastor Nate Wright, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Mrs. Susie Rock, a good friend of our ministry, a she-warrior, as I have described her in the past, <laughs> and a mother and grandmother. So Susie, welcome to the show. Nate, we're going to be delving into motherhood today, and we, we've got Susie to talk about that. I'm excited. I'm excited to get going. And, uh, and just before we get going, I'll, uh, I just want to plug um, a few dates that I hope our listeners are keeping in their minds. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, July 5th to the 8th, we have our Cultural Leadership Academy. Uh, this is for students who are aged 19 to 29. Uh, the idea is that you would come and give us a long weekend and you will get trained by some of our fellows and uh, um, some of our faculty in uh, Christian worldview, Christian philosophy, apologetics, uh, kind of giving you the foundation that you will need to be a cultural leader in whatever sphere you have. Uh, and then that transfers into a sort of online where you get to pick your uh, your track. If you want to be trained in terms of a ministry track, if you want to be trained uh, in a, a specific vocation, uh, then uh, that's the Cultural Leadership Academy and some of the changes that we've made to that. And of course, we have the Youth Worldview Academy. And uh, what this is, is this is training for students aged 14 to 18, giving them a foundation in Christian worldview and Christian philosophy as well. Uh, we have one in the U.S. It's in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and that's July 12th to the 18th. We also have our Canadian Youth Worldview Academy, and that's in Port Colborne, Ontario, from July 28th to August 2nd. So you can go to our website, click on the training programs tab, and you can sign up there. So lots of fun stuff going on, and uh, the fun thing that we have planned for our podcast today is we're going to continue in this series that we've been doing in family. Last week, we talked about fatherhood and masculinity. Uh, today, we're joined by Susie Rock, who is actually, uh, I, I'm sure she gets, I'm sure you get tired of being described as Aaron Rock's wife. So <laughs> I was about to say she She's is uh, okay. one of our fellows, Aaron Rock's uh, wife, but uh, Susie Rock is um, the director of women's ministry at Harvest Windsor. Uh, she's a biblical counselor. Uh, she is the mother of five and grandmother, I think, of three. Is that right, Susie? Third's on the way. Yeah. Third's on the way. So, um, so Susie, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I'm honored. I'm happy to talk about womanhood. That is my passion. So here I am. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, Susie, I've been uh, trolling Twitter a little bit this morning Um and we're going to ask you our first question kind of in the context of this cultural movement uh, away from the family and attacking the family. So I want to start first with just a, a quote from Scott Brown um, and then moving to the, uh, a, a Twitter story really quick. Um, so in the preface of his book, A Theology of the Family, Scott Brown writes, the widespread biblical ignorance regarding the family was disturbing. And he's talking about, you know, starting back in the back in the 50s and 60s. And all the while came the unrelenting attacks of the sexual revolution, radical feminism, the birth control movement, cohabitation, welfare, homosexuality. Uh, godlessness uh, in public education and pornography. The deepening dark age of the family seemed impossible to reverse. Now, this is a book that was written 10 years ago, and now today we've come so far as Twitter today reporting to us that um, there is a male who just said, my first time breastfeeding my daughter. And so there, the story is going out about how a drug-induced man is now attempting to breastfeed an infant. So this is where we are at, and it, it's quite appalling that I even have to ask you this question, but we wanted to just bring our listeners back and, 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 and start this dialogue. We're approaching this in like a, a Titus 3 situation where 
we're not caving into the fact that two men can't talk about motherhood, but why would we do that when we can have a, a, a stateswoman come and, and, and speak for herself? So Susie, we're here. Why don't you answer the question for us and our listeners, what is a woman and how would you define biblical femininity? Right. Well, that's a huge, in some ways, it's a huge question, even though it's so obvious, but it really is a, a concept that is confusing to our world. I remember just a few years ago, I um, was challenged to type in on Google, like, can a man have a baby? And sure enough, the first answer that comes up says, well, yes, you just have to redefine what a man is. And I thought, how ridiculous. Like, of course, we all know men cannot, they are not designed to have babies. And even with your comment about the man breastfeeding, just a year, over a year ago, I was in the birthing room with my daughter as she was giving birth to a baby. She had a midwife, she had the baby at the hospital, but the midwife was there caring for her. And when uh, the baby was out and born and we we're all celebrating, my son-in-law said something to the effect of he wouldn't be breastfeeding. And the midwife said, well, men can breastfeed. You know, there's some cultures where men do breastfeed. And he was so appalled. He, he's still so annoyed by that comment because that is not what men have been designed to do. And so we live in a culture that is so confusing and we raise children in a confusing world where we tell them like, you can be whoever you want to be. And if you feel like being a woman, you can be a woman, but if you want to be a girl, you can be a girl and you can be a boy. And they don't even know who they are, what's expected of them. And so we as Christian parents obviously have a very huge responsibility to teach our children very clearly what is a man, what is a woman, what is a girl, what is a boy. And so as women, we have been created in the image and likeness of God, just like men have. But we have been given, obviously, we have two X chromosomes, right? We're different than what men are. But that means that God has given us unique roles to play as well. And he's uh, given us a, a unique design in culture. And largely, that means we are life givers. And everything about our human, our feminine body has been designed to be life giving, to be beautiful, to be attractive, to be God glorifying. And um, we, we learn that by knowing who our creator is so that we know how to bear his image and to display his beauty in a feminine way. And as women, I have a huge passion to help women to understand uh, the difference between being feminine and the difference between what feminism is. We don't pursue feminism, but we do pursue femininity. And part of that is understanding the beauty and the rule of God in our lives. And as we understand who God is and that he's our creator, we understand that how we live must fall and be in line with who he's designed us to be. And part of that is to understand him as Lord and King of our lives. And so we're learning to be submissive and to, to submit to his rule. And therefore we are also learning to submit to the areas where he's called us to submit in. And if we are wives then we have been called to submit to our husbands, to be a helpmate to our husbands, and that's our specific role. And that's how we live out our femininity by helping him. We, we all have a mission. Men and women have a mission to bring glory to God and to make disciples. And as women, we come alongside men. And specifically, if we're married, we come alongside our husband to help make disciples. And we don't create our own mission. No, we follow the mission of God. And even when we're looking for our identity, our worth, our identity comes from Christ and understanding who he is and how much he loves us and what he's done for us and putting that on display. And as, as life givers, we recognize that God has given women in particular the ability to carry a baby inside the womb, carry it until it is ready to be born. And it's all God. God creates that human being, that human life inside of us. And this is such a privilege. It's such an honor. It's something that men cannot do. God did not design them to do that. And here we have that wonderful, wonderful blessing privilege to, to bring life into this world and uh, to continue to be fruitful and to multiply. We as women have been designed to nurture our children. Men can't do that. Men 
in and of themselves, unless they do crazy hormonal treatment, cannot feed a baby. As women, we've been designed specifically to be able to do that. And so as women, we want to embrace the roles that God has given us and to enjoy them and to uh, um, teach other women to do the same. At the same time, I, I must say my heart goes out to women who know that God designed them to be able to give birth and to nurture children and to raise children. But for one reason or another, they aren't able to. And sometimes that means they've never been able to get married. They haven't found a godly man to to be married to. And so she is not able to have children. And at the same time, there's some women that do get married and they're married to a godly man and they both desire to have children. But for one reason or another, her body is not able to to either conceive or to carry the child through to birth. And she has a a particular burden to carry and she has a a grief that she uh, mourns on a regular basis. And so as much as I believe God designed women to be able to give birth and to be life givers and to be nurturers, and that's a specific beautiful thing that God has given to us, Not all women can. And if she is not able to, not due to her own sin, but just because of um, natural consequences, then we want to love on those women and and, um, continue to just affirm that they too are, are women that are created in the image and likeness of God. And just because she hasn't been given that opportunity to give life in that way, there's many other ways that she can find to be fruitful, to multiply, to continue to be a life giver in the context that God has given to her. And so, yes, definitely a huge, huge heart for women who are struggling in that area and always wanting to affirm that they are just as much women. They are just as much valuable in the kingdom of God as the woman who does have children. That's a really important point that just because uh, you are born into a sin stained world, uh, does not mean that because the effects of those sin have uh, in- impeded your ability to uh, to uh, live out your calling your uh, doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything sinful or wrong with you. There would be men who are called to be providers and protectors who are born uh, in, in ways that impedes their ability to protect and to provide for. So in the same way, we want to be able to affirm God's original design and to call women to it. Um, without, um, and, and at the same time, sort of shepherding and leading and showing women who, because we live in a sin-stained world and uh, their their ability to do that is going to be altered, it doesn't mean that um, the, the direction stays the same, even though it might look a little bit different, right? We're, they're still called to be life givers, I think was the, the term you used, which I really liked. Um, they're they're the, the knitters together of community, right? They create community, they create life, they bring relational connectedness to the world around them. And that primarily is meant to happen within a family, but there are a lot of other ways that that can happen. So a woman who is unable to have children for whatever reason it is, because we do still bear the effects of the curse upon the world, um, that does not mean that her calling is is diminished in any way, that there's still a glory. And in fact, there's a greater glory oftentimes in the ability for uh, us to, despite the sin that stains us, and stains our world to, to still live out a calling that's radical uh, to the way that God designed us. Um, I want to ask, because um, you gave us a lot to think about there, and I wanted to ask, you know, you're you're the director of women's uh, ministries at Harvest, and uh, I know you are a biblical counselor. You've spent a lot of time teaching and counseling and uh, discipling young women. Um you know, as you just kind of painted a view of femininity and motherhood as a sort of central calling to women, what are some lies that modern, even Christian women believe that sort of impedes their ability to live out a, a, a robust, you know, biblical femininity as you've kind of described uh, in, in opening the podcast here? Yeah, there is a lot. I think one of the main things, especially for moms, is uh, there's a guilt if you go out and work outside the home and it's almost as if you, uh, you're you neglecting your family. But at the same time, if you stay home, then somehow you feel inferior to the woman who is working and earning money and has a title and responsibilities. And 
I think that's one of the big things. And really, it's just a misunderstanding of where our worth comes from and where our status, our our um, value, our purpose is, is from. And so I think there's a, a lot of confusion there. And women don't really have a strong sense of what God has called them to um, in regards to that. There is certainly a misunderstanding of, of what submission is. And of course, I think that's been a, a, a very long, bad word in our culture. And as soon as a woman is called to submit, somehow she feels like you are domineering her and you are belittling her and somehow she is less than and yet she's been given all these gifts and abilities. So how come she can't do everything that a man can do? And um it's such a lie. I think as we look to Christ and as we look to the Trinity, we have a very clear understanding that Jesus Christ, who is deity, who is just as much God as God the Father, he submits to the Father in everything. And he only does what the Father has called him to. And he he speaks the very words that the Father tells him to. He is fully submissive to the father because he understands the father's mission. And I think if we as women can understand that submission doesn't make you inferior, it's just a different role that you play. And together you're on mission to build God's kingdom. You don't have to feel inferior. And yet it's such, it's such a difficult concept for many people to get through. And even just understanding, um, you know, where where our worth comes from and who we worship. There's so much confusion in a woman's identity. Um, Women are so insecure, right? And they're insecure if they don't have the title at work. They're insecure if they don't have all the children at home. They're insecure if they don't have the model home that looks like it just came out of a magazine. There's just so many insecurities that women strive for. And really, it's a heart issue. It It's not that social media has created this or social media influencers have created this, but we run to the social media influencers to get our answers rather than going to God's word. And we see the the woman who has the five children and she's homesteading and she's homeschooling and um, she seems to have this picture perfect family. And then we wonder like, why is my home not look like that? Why do my children not always obey? Why do I feel so exhausted and frumpy? And once again, we're, we're running to the wrong sources for our answers. And so there's a lot of lies that women believe, but it's because they're running to the wrong answers. They're not going to God's word. They're not seeing it modeled. And they're just focusing on one aspect of womanhood rather than looking at the full picture. Um, So yeah, it's hard. It's hard being a woman, but so it's hard being a Christian, right? So we're all striving to seek after the Lord and and bear his image and learn what that means, right? Yeah, I thought that was a really strong point when you uh, kind of relayed the idea of of submission, which which still, I mean, even in evangelical churches, um, still ends up being um, a word that kind of makes us recoil a little bit and certainly makes women recoil. But that idea that Christ throughout his earthly ministry constantly pointed to, you know, I did not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, that that submission and that subordination of Christ to the Father, I think, is, is a beautiful picture of what it looks like to kind of, uh, you know, I often tell young women, uh, don't marry a man whose mission and vision in life you cannot give your life to, right? Like at the end of the day, one of the main things I tell young women to look for in a man is, is the direction and the the vision and the mission of his life something that you would be glad to come alongside and give your life to as well? And that's what we see in Christ, right? He, he comes alongside to do the will of the Father and uh, and to sort of uh, denigrate or to de- demean submission is actually to demean Christ, who is is submissive to the Father. Uh, Michael, I want to let you jump in here. So um, do you have any uh, follow-up on that? I think it was just really interesting how basically wherever we look as Christians, and so we're, we're focusing on motherhood here, so I want to stay on Susie's comments towards women. It, it seemed that Susie was saying, wherever you look, somebody somewhere is telling you that what you're doing is wrong. And so the problem is, therefore, then which authority do you accept 
And, you know, women are just so unique. I've been reflecting a little bit on just the difference between the way that my wife and I feel emotion. Um, uh, the other day, you know, Sarah was taking a difficult call and she said, do you want to jump on? And I said, actually, I think I just need to leave so that you can listen because you're a far better listener than I am. And I, it, I don't think they're ready for advice yet. Um, not that Sarah wouldn't throw in advice, but, but the, the, the whole nurture and gathering women are so gifted with that, with such a greater ability to empathize. And like my wife will feel the emotions of other people where I will recognize their situations. Um, and so everywhere a woman goes, where God has given her a unique ability to be a feminine woman, someone is telling her that that's wrong. And I, I, as I was listening to Susie, I was just saying, we have to return to just unapologetically encouraging our young women <clears throat> where they get their worth from. So of course they're worth from uh, being created in God's image. They're worth from a, uh, uh, finding a friend in Jesus, uh, uh, joining the church and, and finding salvation in Christ. Um, but then you, we just have to tell the world you're wrong. Uh, we, we need mothers. Uh, we need women who are going, I'm even thinking of Christ's words here on this whole point of, of women having this great ability to empathize where, and to, and to gather together, uh, where Jesus actually says, you know, Oh, Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those, uh, sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Uh, but you are not willing, like women have this tremendous ability to hold things together and you, you can't experience it until you're 20 years into marriage and you just go, wow, like the heartbeat of the home depends upon my wife. And I don't, I don't mean that in the ultimate depends upon my wife, but there is a true gift from God that women hold the home together. And we started this whole thing. You know, I've got, a, I've got a section in my book about this, like literally by their bodies, like husbands want their bodies. Children want like infants want their bodies. Uh, there's so much need for them to physically and emotionally hold people together. So it's just such a gift. So I want to read a quote and then I'm going to shoot it back to you guys as I was reflecting on that. So J.R. Miller uh, understood the value of motherhood. And this is what he said. A true mother is one of the holiest secrets of home happiness. God sends many beautiful things to this world, many noble gifts, but no blessing is richer than that which he bestows in a mother who has learned love's lessons well and realized something of the meaning of her sacred calling. And so uh, I just wanted to agree with you, Susie, and maybe put it in terms again, like you're under attack everywhere you go. And yet women are so essentially valuable to the mm -hmm. kingdom of God. We just have to keep going back to our young women and saying, you may not figure it all out right now, but you're going to get it and your husband's going to get it and your children are going to get it and they're going to see it. So so perfectly uh, as we persevere together and as we go through ups and downs and you continue to empathize and nurture and bring us all together. I think that's valuable what you said. I think it's very important for both men and older women to continue to affirm to the, to the young women in particular that their role is valuable because somehow another lie we've come to believe is that the role of men is more important to go out to work and earn money is more important than staying home and, and raising children. It's because money has become such a God in our lives and to actually have a, a a title at work, that's somehow more important than having a title of being mom. And that's such a distorted way of thinking of things. And my heart just breaks to think that women actually think that to, to be called a police officer or to be called a, you know, mechanic or whatever it might be is more important than just to be called mom. Like what a, 
what a beautiful title that is and what a beautiful opportunity that we have to just invest in our children and our homes and in the future generation. That's huge. Those are huge responsibilities. And so we have to change our mind about believing that the role that men have is more important. No, they have an important role and they need to fulfill it to the best of their abilities under the Lordship of, of uh, Christ. But we too, like this is our role. Let's embrace that. Let's do what God has called us to do and not feel that it's inferior somehow. So we as older women need to affirm the younger woman in that. And I think it's also very valuable for them to hear that from other men as well. And particularly if they're married from their husbands, that what they're doing is, is important and they wouldn't be more important if they were earning the big paycheck. That doesn't make, give them value. And our world, I think, very much teaches or at least implies that the big paycheck is what gives you your worth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting when we look at kind of the, we, we started this by talking about how confused the culture is about gender, about womanhood, about motherhood. And I think it's it's kind of worth noting, we talked a little bit in the episodes the last couple of weeks as we talked about fatherhood and masculinity, that, um, you know, in a confused, you know, depraved world like ours, we need bold fathers to speak truth. And Michael was was telling us a little bit about something that's going on in the, the gym um, that he and his daughter go to and just his need to speak as a father, uh, to protect and, and uh, kind of speak truth where there's lies. And and it, it is interesting that like, when you look at the, the Garden of Eden, and you look at the the how God gave this this cultural mandate to husbands and wives, right? So it's it, in Genesis one, he's he's talking about you know male and female. I created them, right? In in the image of God, I created them. Male and female, I created them. And and then it's now be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So that cultural mandate is given to husbands and to wives. And then in Genesis 2, you get the zoom in on that day six of creation. We find out that Adam is in fact created first. Eve is created from Adam. Um, but then when you get to Genesis 3, so so God creates Adam and then God creates Eve and it's to them that he gives this cultural mandate, but that, that mandate looks different. And we get a clue from that from Genesis 3 after the fall because when God curses the man and the woman based on um, the fall, he curses the man by cursing the ground and saying that, you know, th through toil, you're going to bring the, the world in, into submission. And to women, he curses the childbearing, right? So I think it actually shows that the, the, the cultural mandate to have dominion over the earth and to fill it and to subdue it actually shows us that the filling aspect is more delegated to the women because it's the filling aspect that they're cursed, you know, where they're cursed. And the husband, it's the it's the subduing. And so here's why I say that. I say that when we look at the culture around us and we see that it's in such confusion and it needs the word of God to come to bear and 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 everything, it seems it's the role of of men to bring order to the chaos. That's the subduing, right? That's the that's bring order where there is chaos. But interesting that that order that's established by men, I think, is meant to be kept and nurtured and made beautiful by women, right? It's sort of like if you picture it as Adam, Adam is expanding the borders of Eden out into the world. But all as the borders expand, Eve is making a home out of, right? She's cultivating the life of, she's nurturing and, and holding together that which Adam has subdued. And, and so if you think about that in terms of the big picture, you think of, you know, the, the role of fathers to bring order to chaos, the role of women to cultivate life in the taken ground. And so when, when you think about it in those kind of big terms, what are, what are some of the ways that, that women uniquely are, are kind of um, designed by God um, like what are some of the biblical responsibilities primarily given to women that you encourage young women, like this is your role, right? So we talked a little bit about motherhood, raising children, that sort of thing. But what are some of the things that within a, a Christian home, this series is all about families. So within a Christian yeah. household, what are the, the primary responsibilities that you would say to a young woman? No, no, that's your role. You take that, you run with that. You have to, that you're responsible before God for that thing. 
Yeah. Well, first of all, I think very much understanding that she is a helpmate to her husband in regards to the mission that he's on and also adopting that mission as hers, but following the lead of her husband. So very much uh, understanding that you are following his lead. You're not doing your own thing. And um, you you take responsibility of the areas where that he's entrusted to you. Um, which can look a little bit differently in different people's homes, right? And as much as like I love to cook and I take the main role in cooking and I don't understand how a family functions when it's not the wife taking on the main role, but that's what it looks like in my home. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It doesn't mean that it's wrong for a man to cook or to enjoy cooking, but the wife should definitely... um, embrace her role and take responsibility to to care for her home in a way that makes it warm and inviting and easy to to be hospitable to bring that order into the home um she has to do her part in maintaining that order instead of trying to um you know create her own agendas or to sit back and be lazy and you know, let her husband do it all while she just stays on her phone and plays games or messages her friends or runs off doing this and that. No, I think very much we take ownership of of wanting to maintain that order and to come alongside the mission of our husband. And um, it really does. Our, our love should be to glorify God and to create a home along with our husband that is a loving place that represents the beauty of Christ, that represents the love of Christ, the grace of Christ, the welcome of Christ, where people want to be, whether it's your husband or your children or other people, people want to come where you are. And it's because you've, in your personality and in the environment that you've created, it's a place that just puts the glory and beauty of God on display. And um, you have meaningful conversations. I think having those meaningful, intimate conversations is such a valuable thing. And that's where women can often be um, a real uh, benefit and complement to to men who might just think more logically and who might be thinking, okay, how do I fix this? How do I solve this problem? No, women come in and they they create an atmosphere where you can actually discuss and have conversations that are loving and filled with grace and thoughtful and um, even help, you know, bring patience along in the home instead of just fixing things right away. You know, maybe we need to put up, help our husbands pause and, and um, I don't know, sometimes men just want to jump in real quickly and, and God has designed them that way. But sometimes women can, by their influence, cause them to pause just a little bit to delay and rethink their decision so that in the end they haven't just made uh, a rash decision but a, a decision that is actually beneficial and certainly along with that comes prayer as women we want to be praying for our husbands and for our children and understanding that whatever happens in the home it's not because we've done it all, but because we've depended on the Lord to help our husbands to lead and to disciple our children and our children are following the Lord, not because we've been perfect parents, but because we've entrusted them to God and we've we've prayed for them. We've taught them the word of God. We've taught them how to apply the word of God and uh, in every area, right? Thinking Christianly in every area of our life, not just when we go to church or when we're memorizing scripture, but in every area, applying that and learning to do that. Um, so yeah, I think as, as as women, we we fall under the headship of our husbands. We don't try to take control in areas where he hasn't allowed us or offered that to us by very much maintaining that order that he has started and helping him in that and being very prayerful and conversational about the whole process. I think that's very valuable. I'm intrigued at the nuance of this conversation because, um, Nate, the way that you just elaborated on the cultural mandate and, you know, talking about that expansion that, you know, cultivating, order out of the chaos and then women coming along and within that order 
um, filling, um, filling the home or, or filling that order with life. You know, we see that biologically, we see that, um, empathetically as we've been talking about. So Susie, as you just said, you know, a a woman has the ability to maybe slow a man's decision-making down and have, you know, infuse a different, you know, a different um, vantage point. You know, we, we can all make rash decisions and we need each other in our, in our different strengths there. And when we, it really comes down to when people try to attack that natural calling, that's when everything falls apart. But when people can accept that harm, that harmonious calling, and of course, this is where the word complementarian comes from, that we complement each other. It is actually really profound to think of the way that, that God has created men biologically, uh, physically stronger, um, uh, how he has created us, the vast majority of us with more of a, of a desire for battle. Um, even if that battle is with me and Nate trying to argue who's going to, who's going to control like the hairstyle of the Ezra podcast in the next number of years, like it, like, and then the flip side, you know, in reflecting, as I reflected on, on, on my wife as well, just that great ability of, of empathy on, on, on the, on the behalf of women. But when you flip it over, you know, it's very often in institutions that the empathy of a woman at the helm of an institution is the very thing that brings utter collapse to the institution because, because she's not living under the, uh, authority or influence of a man that's just saying to her, okay, the empathy has to stop there. Like that dude's not a girl. Like you, you can victimize him as much as you want. You can go give him hugs as much as you want, but stop it. Now you're empathizing too much and now you're moving into a gullibility or the flip side of it is a a man just killing his home with uh, an authoritarianism that is not sensitive and not listening to the nurture of the wife. Like it, it, the solution is in this true acceptance of these roles the problem is often rooted right here. Will I accept my calling as a man and will you accept your calling as a woman? And by the way, as we get older, that curse that like the, like it actually gets harder for you to till the soil as a guy because you get sore muscles and, and you, you, it actually gets harder and, and, Women accept a great price in giving child in, in giving childbirth. It, you actually see that lived out. So I'm just saying we see the beauty of it lived out. We see the actual complexity of the curse being lived out. Mm-hmm. But there's no no one gets to escape this. And if you kick at it, it just doesn't make any sense. So Susie, all of those things that you were just saying uh, make make so much sense. This leads us to Proverbs 31. By the way, Susie, yeah. uh, I wanted to ask you. Proverbs 31 just seems to be like the coolest woman ever. Like she just, <laughs> she just manages the estate. She gets a burly, like she does, she does everything. And it, it seems to be kind of people accepting it as a truism or something to be laughed at or scoffed at. Um, how, what do you do? When, like, how do you try to motivate women when you're in that text of Proverbs 31 and, and you're exhorting the younger women to love their husbands and their children? Well, I think it's a beautiful text that we shouldn't shy away from or be afraid of. It's it's something that we're striving after. And are we going to be perfect at it? No, but it's certainly something that we should be striving for. And I think also understanding, let's look at the whole um, picture there. She, she is um, a woman who is well-respected, who ultimately is living in the fear of the Lord. And that's our goal. Our first question should be not, oh, am I doing all the things that the Proverbs 31 woman is doing? And do I have the maids that are going to help me in my own household to be able to 
give me the opportunity to do all these other things. No, first and foremost, do I have the fear of the Lord in my life? Do I seek to live for his glory first and foremost above all else? Or am I seeking to be a, a people pleaser so that people can pat me on the shoulder and say that, you know, Susie Rock, you're a super woman. Like you can do all these things and you're just so amazing. That's, that's where the problem lies. So it all has to start with being a woman who fears the Lord. And when you do, you will um, increasingly be a woman who is someone who brings honor to her husband and who speaks well of her husband, who has kindness on her lips and who speaks with wisdom, who works hard, right? Works hard in the home. And as she has opportunity, she works hard outside the home as well. And she provides for her family. And once again, like her, her, her uh, intent in all the work that she does is to fear the Lord and to bless her family. And even when she's working outside the home, it is a blessing to her family. And when she rises, she's thinking about everybody else. She's not thinking about herself. She's thinking about the people around her. And she's a humble woman who is simply seeking to serve the Lord. And that all starts with her heart. And so I think the first thing we all have to do is check our hearts. Who am I living for? What is what is my motivation in life? What is driving me? And if it's anything but the, the Lordship of Christ, then we need to recheck that and go back to just surrendering our lives to live for his glory. And then it will be a joy to do all those things. And it won't just be a list of things to accomplish that is impossible, but will increasingly look like her because we are representing and modeling the image of Christ in our lives. Yeah, that's good. I um, One of the things I think about when, and, and as you describe that Proverbs 31 woman, you know, wisdom on her lips and caring for her family and working inside and outside the home and have being of good reputation and speaking well of her husband and her husband is honored in the city gates and all those things. It's interesting because, um, you know, I, I think the, the outside view of kind of um, conservative Christianity is that women are not honored, but they're, um, you know, uh, um, you know, because they're called to be submissive, because they're called to be helpmates. I mean, uh, those are both awful, awful things, you know, um, that that we view women as sort of helpless or um, and and yet the, the Proverbs 31 woman is a very capable, right, very strong, like th- there's no indication in Proverbs 31 that that she won't be okay unless a man comes along in her life, right? Like she's not waiting for, you know, a man to prop her up and give her value and give her worth. She's very capable. And so the submission and the order within marriage and the creation order is not due to um, uh, uh, an insufficiency. It it actually, and and I, I love the way you said it there. So she's, she doesn't, she doesn't submit to a husband because without a man, she's incapable. She, she submits to a husband because she submits to God and God says that she is, she is designed to come alongside and, and bring fullness to his mission. Right. When, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, I I think that was a, that was not a a qualitative statement. God wasn't saying like I made, there's a deficiency in man. I got to fix it. It's, it's what he's saying there is that, you know, man alone is not capable of doing what I've called him to do. And therefore I must make a helper that's fit for him. And so it's not a submission out of an inferiority. It's a submission because as you said, she, she loves God and God says, this is how life works best in our world. Go and, and find a man to help and to, to bring all that fullness into his life because he's going to be chaos without you, right? Like that's, and so anyway, it's, uh, um, it's, it's really, uh, refreshing to hear, um, you know, uh, a a woman who embraces all of the things that our culture wants to kind of shake off. And, and I want to go back to something that you said very, very early on in the podcast, where you're just talking about just the glory of womanhood and the, the privilege of being able to, to give birth. And I think, you know, there's this been this, mantra from the feminists, you know, for so long that women are more than baby makers. And, and I often just kind of want to say, can we just stop for a moment, right? And just reflect on the glory that God gives women the unique ability to shape inside their bodies, a human soul, 
I mean, why, why, why is that a bad thing? Like, why is that the thing that we want to shake off? Why is that the thing that, that we look at as, as, you know, our, our bonds and our, our, our chains? Um, so it, it's just so refreshing to hear you kind of uh, talk about that. Now I, I want to, in just the, the couple minutes we have left here, I kind of want to bring two, two ideas together that I know you're passionate about um, it, in, in a reflection sort of on, on motherhood. I think it's worth noting that Galatians 3.26 describes the church as our mother, right? And mm-hmm. um, and I think that's a really interesting thing. So so Christ in Isaiah 9 is the everlasting father. He is the bridegroom. And then Galatians 3.26, the church is our mother and she is the bride. And then we are, you and I individually, we are the children of that union between the bridegroom and the bride, between Christ and the church. And so I, I, I know these are two things that you're passionate about. You're passionate about womanhood. You're passionate about, about the church. And so w- what is it that, about that analogy that's so potent? What is it that we can learn about womanhood or about femininity from the analogy that Paul says, the church is our mother? What is, how, how is the church like our mother in your mind? Well, it's an amazing way because ultimately the church is um, the family that grows together to disciple the next generation. And we are here to make disciples. We are here to tell people about Christ, to tell people how to live for Christ and to go and um, represent him in all of creation. And so for us to understand that the church is um, like a mother, that's a huge responsibility and in such an essential part of the Christian life. And we as women, if we are mothers, we are absolutely essential to our children to, to disciple them. And the, the role that we play is so valuable and we can either do them good or we can do them harm. And recognizing that if we are absent, if we are neglecting our duties, we are, are harming our children and their ability to disciple them. And um, for, for women who, um, oh, there was a thought that I was just thinking of. Anyways, I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about how so many people have not just been, you know, damaged by bad fathers, but there's so many people who have been damaged by bad mothers. And I have a jail ministry as well. I go into the jail. Um, at this point, I'm only going once a month on Friday afternoons. And so many of the girls there have been damaged because their mothers have abandoned them, abused them, neglected them, allowed men to come in and, and abuse them. And they have, they have mother issues. And that's not, that's such an awful thing for us as women to do that. And um, the church does not neglect its children. And as mothers, we should not neglect, we should not abandon, and we should not poorly represent Christ likeness to our children. And so we have a huge responsibility. And when we fail, we do a lot of damage and we have to take ownership for that. Actually, Uh, on that point, Susie, as we're exploring metaphors, um, that's a very good point that you were talking about. If, If the church as, as mother do, does not fail the disciples, then there's a great ministry there. And if the church does as mother, then the, it's the same type of byproduct in, in the family. Um, when we see the metaphor of husband and wife, and when we see the, um, the instruction of a wife to submit to her husband as, as to, as to the, as, as the church does to Christ, there we also have like another metaphor explaining this wonder about a a woman preaching to her husband and preaching to her children the beauty of the church. Mm. And I this is a very practical question for you. I in my pastoral ministry can almost say down to a T that if I have a woman who loves her husband in the home and then preaches the church to her family, meaning, meaning through her love for her husband and her affection for the greater body of Christ, 
it's almost down the line that she has children who love Christ and love the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is also true. And I wanted to ask you if that's your experience as being a pastor's wife, where you have women who are anti their husband or anti the church. They don't want to, they don't want to preach the church. Do you have that same experience where now you're, now you're seeing a whole generation of young adults just stray from the life of the church because they've got mother issues? Yeah. You know what? One of the worst things we as mothers can do is be complaining, grumbling woman. And sadly, that is such a characteristic that is so common among so many women. Women complain and they grumble and they're so hard to satisfy. And that is so destructive in the discipleship of our children. I think one of the best things we can do for our children is to praise our husbands and to affirm the role that our husbands have, because that builds them up. And that shows that the role of the husband and the man is so valuable. And at the same time, being women who are, are servant minded and who are grateful to be serving the family and to serve within the context of the home. But the woman who's at home complaining about the laundry she has to do and the dishes that have to be done and the food that has to be cooked and just always griping and complaining, she's not raising up the role and in um, responsibilities of motherhood or femininity. And it's so destructive. And she might be doing it to try and receive affirmation. Maybe her family never praises her for what she does and neglects her and takes advantage of her. But whatever the reason, there's no justified reason for us as women to become complainers and grumblers. We are actually um, being judgmental in the role of affirming what manhood should be and what womanhood should be if we are complainers. And so rather, we need to use our words to build up men and to to thank them for the work that they do and for going outside the home and earning the paycheck and for providing for us and protecting us and, you know, even taking taking the lead on some of the discipline in the home, right? We need to thank our husbands and let our children hear us praising our husbands. And we need to be thankful for the roles that we have and embrace them and enjoy them. And when we do that, our, our children will grow up and say, it's good to be a man and it's good to be a woman. Amen. Well, let it be said and let it be done. You've heard it from Mrs. <laughs> Susie Rock. Ladies, she has exhorted you uh, to some great and wonderful things. And I think this conversation has been tremendously nuanced. And I have I valued it because we get to go out and celebrate these roles and celebrate each other as as uh, distinct sexes. It 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 is always an astonishment to me the battle of the sexes rather than the battle for the sexes mm -hmm. and we need to be battling for the sexes and so i hope this podcast has been an encouragement to you listener um i hope Susie, as you're you go out and you continue your ministry uh, this has been an encouraging conversation uh to you because we, we thank you and we value you and everybody, just remember, we are in this to accept God's authority in our life so that we might create life. And Nate, what a great, what a great explanation of the, the cultural mandate. I, I really thank you for that. I'm going to absolutely steal that, not give any <laughs> reference to it at all in an upcoming sermon. Plagiarism, like utter guilty. Okay, Go Nate, why don't you uh, sign off for us? <laughs> Um, well, uh, just as we conclude here, we want to thank Susie. Thank you so much for uh, coming on and uh, being a part of our, this uh, series on family. Um, and uh, we want to remind all of our listeners, as always, that from him and through him and to him are all things. We'll see you next week on the podcast for Cultural Reformation. <laughs>